You're listening to Chicago Stories, a podcast from City Hall featuring the stories of everyday Chicagoans and special guests, as told to Mayor Rahm Emanuel. This is Mayor Rahm Emanuel, Chicago Stories. We're here with Hemi Perez, who's here, uh, is a leading Israeli venture capitalist and the chairman of the Perez Center for Peace and Innovation. I wanted to start on the innovation part. Yeah. Two parts. One is, you've said before that the next chapter of venture capital won't be around AI, won't be really around uh, block trade. It will be on impact investment. What, did you, what do you mean by that, and how does that bear out for how you look at your work? So, you know, being investing in uh, technology companies mm-hmm. for 30 years, mm-hmm. you figure out which companies are more exciting, which ones are better than the others, and you realize that the ones that are better are the ones that have a purpose, have a mission, and basically they create some kind of a positive global human impact. Because when you just sell a product, when you just uh, do it for the business side of it, mm-hmm. for the revenues or profits, it's nice and it's great. But if there's an extra mission mm-hmm. around it, then I think it connects and brings together customers and partners and employees. So when we started uh, to invest, we saw basically that we had two pockets in our suit. One was for (laughs) business and the other one was for donation. Mm -hmm. But slowly, those who gave donations wanted to see how that money is being deployed more like a business Mm -hmm. with results, with outcome. And those that invested in businesses wanted to have more than just profits. Mm -hmm. And so slowly, we started to see more and more pockets in this suit. And people call it impact investing. So you try to... somebody in the family, a tailor or something like that? Is there a metaphor for why we're doing the suits? <laughs> <laughs> I think people that are making money, uh, that make making a lot of money, right. moving to the giving side of uh-huh. things, they want to do it like an enterprise. Mm-hmm. People like Bill Gates and others. And so I think it created and uh, inspired a lot of people from the donor side and from the business side to come together and make money while you do something really, really good. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, those companies that are doing both, in my view, are gonna be the more uh, resilient, uh, the more successful ones, the more desired ones. And when you have competition and human talent, Mm -hmm. especially on the young generation, I think they will turn to those companies that are doing something with a purpose, with a meaning. Some public good. Some public good. Beyond just... A profit margin. Yes. I'll, no. give, I'll give you an example. Yeah. A company that, that uh, we invested in, which is helping uh, bus systems in cities to run more efficiently, they can do it based on the profit that they provide to the city or the reduction of cost. Mm-hmm. But when they start showing that they reduce pollution and they give the drivers better working hours mm-hmm. and they, they need less infrastructure, then there's something positive that is being contributed and the city starts to understand it and the partners and the customers and the employees. So the company is becoming much better enterprise mm-hmm. than it was just for profit. Do you think that's about technology? You think it's about this generation, about wanting to do something that's bigger than themselves uh, that's speaking to that? Or do you think you get an extra value out of the workers that you wouldn't have gotten if they were just doing marketing or sales at a company or something like that? I think it's coming from both sides. Mm -hmm. With innovation, things are becoming more affordable. Mm -hmm. We're becoming more connected. Information flows. Mm -hmm. Things are becoming more visible. And when that thing happened, people are looking for, you know, what's the next thing? What's Mm -hmm. the meaning of all this? And I think it's also a combination of the young generation that is so different than other young generations. Mm -hmm. They're facing completely different challenges than people faced, uh, let's say, a century ago. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you bring both of them together and you say, let's move forward into a new age where we can do better for the world and leverage science and technology Mm -hmm. and entrepreneurship, then I think we can create a more sustainable world. I think it was also endorsed by the UN Mm -hmm. with all the 17 goals of sustainability. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where the world is heading. So you wear two hats. One is head of the institute. I have one head with yeah, two heads. Yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> since we're in the Taylor thing, you have two yarmulkes on, okay? Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> one for innovation as a venture capital, one obviously fulfilling the Perez Center. Yes. How does peace and innovation go together? And do you see them uh, going together? I mean, I 
seen your father talk. I've seen you talk about yeah. why these are partners. How do you see them as partners? Yeah, so I learned from my father the great vision that he had seeing how the world is moving from an old age to a new age, mm -hmm. and he spoke about it. So he told me, you know, the old age is a time where people became great based on the land and the natural resources. Mm -hmm. So this is why human beings set up nations and borders and flags and created militaries and went to war. Mm -hmm. And the history is full of greatness through bloodshed and wars. Mm -hmm. The greatest leaders are known for their killing. Now we are getting into a new age where the computer is becoming stronger than the sword. We have for the first time in our history an opportunity to become great not on the expense of others. Mm -hmm. Think about Israel. Israel is a state, and I'm taking out the politics about what Don't we worry, have we're going to get to that. <laughs> we we'll get the politics out. But think about Israel. It's a nation that grew on a very small piece of land mm -hmm. with no water, no food, no natural resources, and still it grew like a tree into new heights. Mm -hmm. And the roots were science, technology, innovation, education. And so you can really grow like a tree. And when you grow like a tree, you, have to, you don't have to expand horizontally. You can do it vertically. Mm -hmm. So I think science and technology allows us to grow vertically. Mm -hmm. And we can compensate for everything that we don't get on the horizontal axis. Mm -hmm. This is why peace and innovation are coming together. Every nation that will become more innovative mm -hmm more uh, oriented on its uh, entrepreneurs and uh, the science and technology and innovation by and large, not only uh, scientists, uh, will become a greater and stronger uh, nation, not on the expense of others. Or in his words, we're entering an age where we can live in a world of winners only. Nobody needs to lose. We mm. don't have to kill anyone. Mm. We want more energy, we can generate it. I mean, Israel's, there's a lot of books about the innovation nation. Yes. When you read those and you see the role of technology, but the universities, but also the military is predominant, what's missing in that narrative that you think is somebody who's on the first floor, if not the basement, of this incredible, the last 20 years of technology and innovation, when you look at the amount of companies and, uh, that have come out of Israel, not just because they're NASDAQ listed, you have great universities, you have a military, yeah. But what's missing in that narrative or analysis that you as a venture capitalist says this is something that actually isn't captured yet and has not been written about? If you were going to write that book, how would you write that book with these two chapters or this one chapter in the beginning? You must have a different take on this. Yeah. First of all, I think Israel was blessed with nothingness. The fact that we had nothing. <laughs> Who knew we were inviting Martin Buber for an interview? <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to show my parents they get their money's worth out of a college education. <laughs> the fact that Israel had nothing forced it to become innovative. Mm -hmm. And so when we wanted to settle down and, and create the state of Israel, we had to innovate in agriculture, water, mm -hmm. energy. Then the country never provided us with a shelter mm -hmm. uh, to keep us safe against our neighbors. Mm -hmm. So we build a wall of defense that is completely based on science and technology. The same thing was done with our economy because mm -hmm. we could not export anything besides our brain power. I would say initially what we missed is the connectivity to the world, the mm -hmm. openness to the world, the ability to reach out. We were living on an island and the idea was to turn this island into a ship that can sail the ocean. Mm -hmm. Now, technology and science did it for us. The internet that came on board and mm -hmm. then the internet of things and artificial intelligence connected us. What we really miss, uh, in my view, when I'm looking at the Israeli part of what I do, mm -hmm. is peace between us and our neighbors. Because a company that is set up in Israel cannot scale from where it is. It has to... It has to take the direct flight to Chicago, maybe, and, and partner with, uh, with uh, the Chicago uh, industries to build a smart city, for example. We cannot do it locally. We cannot do it regionally. And our people are too small to become users of technology. That the we scale can never, is not the, possible. The scale is the scale. We are missing the scale. But we're getting over it. And slowly, this island is starting to move. When we have peace, we will not be able only to sail. We'll be able to fly. And that's what we're missing. Now, America has been that scalability. Do you still see, the, uh, given what's happening in 
the Middle East, given what's happening to the peace process, and I don't mean just the two-state solution, do you see the Mideast still as a scalable market in a way, not that it would replace the United States, but in that vision where Israel would be really integrated into the Middle East and able to scale its technology into that greater Middle East policy or poli yeah. politics? We are blessed with a strong uh, connection with the United States. My father always said that America is great mm -hmm. because it is a giver and not a taker. Mm -hmm. And uh, that uh, partnership, that strategic partnership is so crucial and so important for us. As for America, I believe it is still the leading force and it, it's going to stay because of, of its values, because of its ideas because of its uh, size and ability to scale in different ways. So in America, you don't have to become global. When you are in America, you are already global. Mm -hmm. The ability of Israel is to connect to the US and scale our businesses mm -hmm. from Israel into New York or Silicon Valley or Chicago or other countries or other cities mm -hmm. or states, then I think we will be able to scale even though we are part of the Middle East. Our challenge yeah. is how do we make our environment an environment that is moving forward with us? Mm. And I think the uh, challenge of the United States is to make sure that its direction is not uh, uh, shifting or drifting. Still, as a leader, you have to be the one who sees the road ahead and mm. understand where the world is heading. And many, many countries are still following the United States. And I think this is for many generations is going to stay the same. But what about the role of Israel in the Middle East? And given that some of the barriers that existed before are either becoming thinner, I wouldn't say they're disappearing, yeah. but the vision always of being a regional economic power where Israel was part of that. Do you think that's possible or do you think that's uh, not possible. I'm I'm inching closer and closer to the uh, <laughs> the topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I noticed. I'm taking noticed. you first to your ankles, then your knees, and then uh, we'll swim here. I noticed. Yeah. You know, I, I have a, I have a strong belief, and I'm sorry if it sounds not modest, yeah. that as an Israeli and as a as a Jew, I think we have a mission in the world. I really believe in it. I believe in it even as an investor in technology companies. And I believe in the values of Tikkun Olam, mm -hmm. in repairing the world and making it better. I believe in the idea that Israel is a promised land that has a contingency to be moral. And I believe that if we are to continue on those two tracks, mm -hmm. morality and advancements in technology, then we will be able to move forward. And I believe that if we reach out to our neighbors and say, we want to live in peace with you, Mm -hmm. But in order to live in peace, we need to share the tomorrow that we are going to have. If we're not going to share the same tomorrow, how can we deal with all the past atrocities? Mm -hmm. And I believe that uh, the question in the world today on the leadership side is who is moving forward as opposed to backwards mm -hmm. and who is trying to divide us between right and left. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest mission in the world is to move forward. And that was something that was decided after the Second World War. In many ways, it was uh, forgotten by some countries. And the idea now is to find the right leadership that will say, we need to move forward. We need to move into this new age of science and technology where we can live together. Mm -hmm. We need to reach out and collaborate because as human beings, we create so many global problems that the only way for us to deal with those problems is if we are unified. Let me press you then, because you know we just went through an election where technology played uh, maybe not a, a unifying force. A lot of people see, you talk about the promise of technology and science, but a lot of people see it rather than bring, bringing people together, playing a divisive role where people get you know, siloed into their uh, ghetto, so to say, yeah. and siloed by either ethnicity, blood, race, religion that it's not the unifier we're talking about here, but actually a div a, a plays a divisive role. So why do you have such confidence that it can do that? Because it's more neutral than affirmative. Why do you see technology as that unifier when a lot of people see it as having played a more, and continues to play a very divisive role? First of all, I'm, in, I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist, <laughs> and, and so I, I'd rather look at the bright side of things. But you are right. Technology is, you know, neutral. Mm -hmm. It doesn't decide if you manipulate it for the good uh, reason or for the bad stuff. Mm -hmm. That is really up to us as human beings. If we want to leverage technology and science for the benefit of all, and this is why I thought 
impact investing and the morality that we're entering and the meaning that we're entering to things is a necessity for human beings. If we want to sustain, if we want to grow, if we want to live together safely and flourish, mm -hmm. then we have to introduce to the business world those moral values and those senses that we have to move forward together. It's not just moving forward fast. It's making sure that others are not left behind. Mm -hmm. When others are left behind, we cause this left-right division. So first of all, I'm an optimist, and I believe that with the right leadership, with the right set of mind, mm -hmm. with the right regulation maybe in some cases, we can have technology and science as a driving force for a better tomorrow as opposed to uh, a worse uh, world. It's up to the leaders. And I like to see leaders that are doing exactly that, bringing all those mm -hmm. moral values and innovations together in order to make a better world. The Perez Center, what are like the two or three things that it's working on today that you think are the most promising for the vision that your father and yourself hold for the center? And given that, I mean, I don't know, somebody that was, I would say, present at the creation of the Oslo Accord, and it seems, I would say, is on fumes if not running out of gas right now, yeah. or on, I hit a really long pause button here. Mm -hmm. What do you think this, I mean, the role of the foundation, the role of the institute, what are some of the most promising things it's doing since the politics seem to be frozen in place? That's the best way to describe it. I have a yeah. more nefarious way to describe it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's a, it's a great question. And it's, it's part of it is why I'm here. Because mm -hmm. when we met in Israel and we spoke, and you told me about the vision that you have for Chicago to become mm -hmm. the smartest city on earth mm -hmm. and to leverage that for the betterness of the people that live here, different communities, mm -hmm. Uh, in Chicago and make it really a city that is moving forward. When you spoke, I thought about Israel, I thought about what we do. So we have several mission statements. The first one is really to work with the young generation in the state of Israel to bring them to the center, to mm -hmm. this amazing visitor center that we have created and show them the roadmap from the old world to the new world. Show them what Israel has done what happened in our country for the last 100 years. And we started with universities before we had a state. Show them also the challenges and opportunities of tomorrow and show them what young men and women are doing right now to make this world better with science and technology, to be inspired by the individuals, to be inspired by the power of technology. So that's our mission statement in Israel, work yeah. with children in schools, uh, work with soldiers and officers in the military, work with students mm -hmm. and, and everyone who is not part of this ecosystem. In our case, ultra-Orthodox, Arabs, etc. The second thing that we want to do is the reason we are here. We want to start and establish what we call innovation affairs, not foreign affairs. Foreign affairs is done between mm -hmm. foreigners. Innovation affairs is done between collaborators. Mm -hmm. And I believe that what we try to do with my father's legacy is to take the idea of the Paris Center for Peace and Innovation, bringing peace and innovation together. Innovation is bringing young generation together and peace is setting the values. And I'd love to have agreements like the one that we're going to sign today with other cities in the world, mm -hmm. with other countries. I wanna be in China, I wanna be in the US, I wanna be in Europe, I wanna be in Latin America, I wanna be in Africa, I wanna be in the, in the Arab world. Mm -hmm. And I want to have those centers collaborate and cooperate and think about solutions for problems that we all suffer from, whether it's global terrorism or climate change or, you know, the economy yeah. by and large or by movement of people due to different uh, reasons. So, you know, we're also working with uh, people in Berlin. Mm -hmm. We want to put uh, a Paris Center for Peace and Innovation in Berlin. Mm -hmm. In this case, we're not going to talk about the past, <laughs> but we are going to talk about the present and the future, what Israelis and Germans can do together if they collaborate. See, I believe that we're in a period of time, 20 years, we're going to look back through the rearview mirror. We have the withering of the nation state and the emergence of both the city state and not for profits doing things today and universities that you used to assume for the responsibility of the nation state. It isn't what it used to be. It's not going to be. And because of technology, players can move forward. And either they're filling a vacuum or move forward because they can move forward. I mean, I take one anecdote. I took all the presidents of the universities, went to Israel. We signed each university got 
dating yeah. services. They did it. Yeah. They married another university in Israel to do water research. I didn't call yeah. the State Department. Fantastic. I didn't call the Commerce Department. My view is this, the presidents of the universities did not. You're actually the first partnership was signed between the University of Chicago uh, and the university in uh, Beersheba. Mm -hmm. And it was at your father's uh, office. Yeah. We didn't need any other players to do it. Absolutely. And that's what I, I mean, I, to me, I think you're envisioning where the world is going because Washington and Brussels aren't what they used to be or expected of. It's very much true. As a matter of fact, you know, we have to understand who are going to be the next empires, if you want. Mm -hmm. The empires of the new world. I'm not talking about the empires of yesterday. The mm -hmm. empires of yesterday, you know, were nations expanding with military force, with the sword. Mm -hmm. The new empires are going to use computers, are going to use data, mm -hmm. are going to use scientists, are going to use brain. So it could be cities, mm -hmm. it could be universities, it could be enterprises. There's going to be a whole slew of new empires of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Part of the mission statement that I think the Paris Center is setting forward, and that is something that my father used to do when he met you know, with mm -hmm. leaders like yourself or heads of companies, enterprises, mm -hmm. and he told them, you have a mission on your shoulder because you're going to carry the future of human beings. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be just by states. It's going to be done by leaders from different new empires. And this is why we want to create this network, and this is why I very much value your initiative to invite us to sign this agreement between Chicago and the uh, Paris Center for Peace and Innovation. It's going to be the first, at least in our view, mm -hmm. for us, the first international uh, meaningful cooperation. And we expect to take it further. And when we do that, you know, I see the people that are showing interest in mm -hmm. the Paris Center for Peace and Innovation. As a mayor, you know, that many years ago, people wanted to have in their city, you know, very good universities. Then they wanted to have great shopping centers. Mm -hmm. Now they want to have great innovation centers. They want to see more and more innovation. And when you put the three of them together, you're going to get really good cities. So I think that's the power of uh, mayors around the world to really become the new entities that are driving forward. I also think as people lose confidence in the nation state or in politics, the government closest to people is the municipal government and the one that they feel like they also have the biggest impact on. And there's a lot of instability. There's the place that there's stability is the local government. Mm -hmm. And I also, mayors with universities and not-for-profits are the best at, I think, creating what I call live, work, and play. That balance equal. Nobody's got the equilibrium exactly right, and it's never really an equilibrium. And the not-for-profit world, the university world, think tank world, with municipal government, can create investments yeah. that happen to work that way in that effort. So I've slightly talked around a very important subject to me. <laughs> <laughs> so given my work with your father, given your work with your father, given the institute. And we just had an election in Israel. Can you have a Jewish democratic state? And I want to ask you, given what happened, the outcome of the election, et cetera, Israel somewhat, in my view, getting to a place, given some of the discussions by Bibi Netanyahu and the idea of annexing the West Bank, is it getting to a crossroads where those two impulses, a democratic, Jewishly identified state, those are in conflict rather than complementary anymore? Yep. And if I didn't ask that, my mother would say, this is not a worthy interview. <laughs> 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 Need I tell you what side of the question she's on? <laughs> so, so let me tell you. I, th I think for me, the most important thing is, first and foremost, before I relate to the other side, to mm -hmm. the Palestinians, mm -hmm. uh, I think we in Israel uh, are at a crossroad mm -hmm. between our ability to sustain the idea of being a Jewish democratic state mm -hmm. and either to become a, a, a Jewish state or a democracy. Mm -hmm. For me, the future of Israel is, it can be uh, significant and outstanding if we manage to keep, I always try to look at it as a train that is running on rails. Mm -hmm. One rail is being Jewish, the other one is being a democracy. Mm -hmm. And when one rail is trying to be diverted and to cross over the other rail, then that's the time where the trail is getting off track and mm -hmm. rolls over. 
And I'm very, very sensitive and very worried about keeping those trails together. Mm -hmm. uh, what influences those rails is trust. Mm -hmm. And if trust is there, then you can keep those trails really parallel. Mm -hmm. And the biggest questions, by the way, this is our next conference that we do at the center in Israel, the next one after we did the previous one celebrating 70 years of uh, innovation and, mm -hmm. uh, uh, of course, uh, independence. The next conference we're going to do is about trust, how we, how we gain trust. Mm -hmm. And the answer for me of gaining trust in our region is when the Palestinians and the Israelis will say, let's look at tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Let us create a tomorrow that you and us can share. Mm -hmm. That tomorrow today does not exist. And I can see it. I know it's there. And for me, that tomorrow is a tomorrow when Jews and Arabs will build mm -hmm. companies together. They will shape the economy together. And they will live side by side knowing that the land is less important mm -hmm. and the borders are less important. I always like to quote in that aspect, uh, Pablo Picasso said once, you have to learn the rules like a professional so you can break them like an artist. <laughs> I think if we draw borders, if we shape some kind of an agreement, mm -hmm. but more importantly, if we move forward and we build an economy that we will share, mm -hmm. then we can break all those borders and we can break all those rules and live together. Mm -hmm. So that is the biggest question. Now, in order to get there, we need to keep those trails in parallel. We cannot allow to run over our democracy mm -hmm. and become more Jewish. And we cannot use democracy to uh, give up on our Judaism. My father's book, No Room for Small Dreams, the first chapter starts with saying farewell to his grandfather mm -hmm. in Vishniva mm -hmm. when he and his mother and brother came to live in Israel before there was a state. His grandfather told him, my son, never forget to stay Jewish. Mm -hmm. And that is something that my father took with him through his life. And it goes also to my family. But being Jewish means for me, having the Bible as an inspiration source, as a source of wisdom, not as a source of exercising authorities or going backwards mm -hmm. to achieve what we have lost over time. And the values of the Bible are such that are becoming the values of what democracy is for me. And so if you manage to keep those two tracks mm -hmm. and get Israel to be in parallel of Judaism and democracy, we will be able to achieve peace. Uh, just so you know, you're in a city whose motto based on Daniel Burnham is make no little plans. It never <laughs> stirs people's uh, blood yeah. for great things. As a student of politics, but also a student of Israeli policy, and I say student study, you talk about the divisions, you haven't, but obviously there are divisions in Israeli society. Yeah. The thing that uh, concerns me coming out of this election is the division between the American Jewry and yeah. the Israeli public. Yeah. That you have one set of values here and one set of politics here in the United States yeah. and another one in uh, Israel. And while there are some troubling trends in Israel, the most troubling apparent trend is the one between I think the rock solid support Israel has among American Jewry. I mean, is that a concern in Israel at all? Or people don't see that because they're somewhat blinded by the relationship between the prime minister and the president at this time. So I'm sure that there are some people in Israel that are blinded by the mm -hmm. relationship. And I think it's good to have good relationships mm -hmm. with an American president. It's great. Uh, it's good also to have great relationships with the Chinese president <laughs> and uh, the president of Russia and other countries. And to his credit, I would say that uh, our prime minister is doing a, a great work working with other countries around the world and trying to uh, shape a, a relationship that mm -hmm. are based on the ability of having Israel contribute to whatever they do. But for me, the relationship between the Israelis and the Jewish people are dear to my heart. Uh, you know, Jewish people are, at the end of the day, we're one people. Mm -hmm. We have one destiny. And for me, it doesn't matter where you live. And I want the Paris Center for Peace and Innovation to be also a connector mm -hmm. between the Jewish diaspora and the Israelis. 
there are many, many people that are worried about it because sometimes, you know, we, we are finding ourselves on conflicts around religious, mm -hmm. but religious conflicts are a result of the, the fact that sometimes religious and politics are coming together. And uh, it is significant in Israel, as you know. So my call, if I could call to the Jewish people, I would say, come to Israel, visit us, connect with us mm -hmm. on the values that we have, on our ability to create innovation that really makes the world better. And don't just look at connecting with us just on the merits of uh, religious mm -hmm. uh, acceptance or disacceptance. There's so much more that we can do together. In, in Sometimes when I think about my country, I think that the two things that are really hurting me, the, because we gave up collectively, mm -hmm. not necessarily um, we didn't reach the point of no return, but in many ways we gave up on hope. We gave up on our dream to live in peace, mm -hmm. and I'm not willing to accept that loss. And the second thing is because of po politics getting together with religious, mm -hmm. As Jewish people, sometimes we give up on the Bible. We give up on those wise books that the <laughs> Jewish people own. So I say, let's let's come together. Let's find ways to connect. It doesn't have to be only politics. So much more to Israel and to the Jewish people around the world. Let's find those roots together. Hemi, uh, my dad's a doctor. And I always tell my mother I didn't. His I, mother was Yeah, 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 yeah. I said his mother was blessed. Yeah, and I said, and his oldest son is dying. I said I became a spin doctor. So that's how I made my mother happy. So let me, did you ever have the pull of politics? Did you ever, uh, the, uh, you went into venture capital, one of the first to see the promise of what was happening in Israel. Way, way, I mean, you created almost the first venture capital fund, if my research serves me right. Given your father's role, did you ever want to get in the family business, so to say, or you saw it and said, that's the last thing I ever want to do? Uh, was there ever an interest for electoral politics, or kind of, or do you see the foundation as kind of the new politics? You know, what I care about is my country. I, I want to make my country strong, and I want mm -hmm. my country to be living in peace with our neighbors. Mm -hmm. I want to see end to war. Mm -hmm. I want to see end to poverty. I want to see many, many good things for the country. And the question is, in order to be effective, where do you go? What do you do? I divide my time now between the driving force of the state of Israel, which is entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and innovation. It, it is a driving force, in my view, for this new age. And at the Paris Center for Peace and Innovation, I try to reach out to as many people as we can within mm -hmm. Israel mm -hmm. and outside of Israel and try to pitch those ideas. If you ask me if I would have been interested to be in uh, a leadership position in Israel, uh, yes. Yeah. I think the answer is yes, if I can be effective. Mm -hmm. But the infrastructure today in the political system is so problematic, I don't even know where to start. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really, really uh, problematic. It's a small country. As long as my father was in politics, mm -hmm. I stayed out of it. I, I did not think that it's right for Right. For, you know, two Any families. sense of nepotism. Yeah, yes. exactly. Now that he's gone, maybe it's time for me. Mm -hmm. um, and as I say, I'm a carrier of the disease, but I have not <laughs> been yet completely affected. <laughs> you know, uh, your father, and I have to, t I think I told you if I didn't. So I brought Leah, uh, Z Zachariah had his bar mitzvah in Israel. Yeah. And your father had the whole family to his office. Uh, Alana had her bar mitzvah in uh, Prague. And uh, Leah... When we moved here, we couldn't. So anyway, I brought her for her bat mitzvah to Israel. And I brought her by to see your father. And it's one of my favorite quotes of a leader I've ever had. And not to, I'm gonna, I think I'll bastardize your dad's accent, but he says, remember now that you are an adult. <laughs> I can do this because my dad has the same <laughs> accent. In, in the Jewish faith, you have a bat mitzvah and now you're an adult. And because of this, you must understand that there are two books in the world. There is the history book and the guest book. From now on, you must decide which book your name goes in. And between Leah and I, that's become our little joke. <laughs> but she becomes a dancer, I say, right before I said, remember, as you dance, you get to decide whether you're going to be in the guest book or the history book. You're right. So your father had a... Uh, He's got two out of three children's bar mitzvahs under his belt already. <laughs> <laughs> Lightning round real quick. We're going to test your new home, Chicago. You get to vote now. Here it is. Absolutely. Are you a Cubs or a Sox fan? 
<laughs> There's no idea. Yeah, yeah don't worry. <laughs> I <laughs> wish both of them great success. <laughs> <laughs> Your father would be proud That's, of that answer. <laughs> you know, Begin, when, when Menachem Begin was prime minister, they asked him about the war between Iraq and Iran. And he said, I wish both sides <laughs> great success. So I don't know. Okay. Do you like thick or thin pizza? I like uh, thick pizza. Okay, yeah. well, you're in the right city. <laughs> Do you like uh, the, John Hancock or the Sears Tower? John Hancock. Okay. The lake or the river? The river. Uh, you're so far, you can, you can vote in an election. We can have you run for office here, not Israel. <laughs> 12 inch or 16 inch softball? Uh, that I don't know. Yeah, 16 in Chicago. 16. I'll show you. I'll send, yeah. you. I'll send you one home. Probably 16. <laughs> <laughs> We're with Hemi Perez here on Chicago Stories. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much. You've been listening to Chicago Stories with Mayor Rahm Emanuel. You can subscribe and leave a review on Apple Podcasts and tweet your guest ideas using hashtag ShyStories. Thanks for listening.